And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, who are following us today. Our panel, as you can see, we look at how COVID-19 has been a disruption for us, but also how it may open opportunities. And I hope that some of you may have listened to the video that was sent to you before the conference, where I illustrated some of the examples that have come to our attention at Alzheimer's Disease International during this period. Given that we've just heard from the WHO, this gives me a chance to remind everybody that despite a lot of promises, a lot of pieces of paper, we still are a very, very long way away from meeting the targets of the Global Dementia Action Plan. Deborah Kestel, the WHO's Director of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, has promised us at our own conference next week to give us a much more detailed roadmap about how are they going to go uh, fostering these collaborations and further action. Because as you know, we have been extremely active doing this. And uh, for many government, it's still a very distant target. Having said that, for some governments this year, this has been a very present target. And we have been very pleased to uh, look at the fact that there has been progress and we've been monitoring those progress, and indeed there's been momentum, and some countries have made very large announcements. Uh, two of these countries are with us today on the panel, uh, with Franca Gatto and Wali Wang, both respectively we speak about China and we speak about uh, Canada. But let me introduce you my panelists first fully. So with me is Frank Gatto, the Director of Aging, Seniors and Dementia Division Center for Health Promotion at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, there is uh, um, Wali Wang, the Associate Director for Dementia Care and Research Center at Peking University, Institute of Mental Health. Health. She's also the Chair of the Clinical Research Division and Associate Director of the Beijing Municipal Key Laboratory for Translational Research on Diagnosis and Treatment of Dementia. We also have Philip Balshai, the Chief Operating Officer of Homestead Senior Care in Switzerland. And last, but by no means least, Kate Swaffer, the Chair, Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Dementia Alliance International, with Wali Wang, also a board member of Alzheimer's Disease International. So welcome to all of my panelists. Now, I'm going to ask the, the uh, person that is directing the webinar to put on the first slide, please. Uh, if we can have the first slide from me. Yes, there we go. So I just wanted to put on a slide because I wanted you to uh, be able to see uh, what uh, some of those challenges that I was reminding you of some of those challenges um, that I had been talking about in my introductory speech were. So I think the thing that we are going to focus uh, more in this webinar today is in, first and foremost, the lack of data. So we still are having a lot of problems collecting data from governments around mortality during COVID-19 for people with dementia. What we know is that those countries that have been courageous enough to publish those that data, and that has been the UK, Italy and Canada, have reported over a quarter of the deaths being uh, of people with COVID-19 being of people that have dementia. So it has been devastating for our community. Um, we at ADI have seen uh, a trampling of human rights of uh, our elders as never before. And we have decided to channel our outrage at this in positive manners going forward. I think we've all realized the little value in many cases that has been put on the life of seniors, sometimes simply as, a, as an issue of mistakes. Nobody has thought that certain things can happen. We understand that. But nevertheless, when we saw triage guidelines this year that deprioritize people that have dementia, well, we had no other way but raising these at the highest possible level. That is simply not on. Now, if I can continue, there's been also some positive uh, outcomes. Yes, there has been disruption to diagnosis. There may have been disruption to clinical trials, some of the questions that we are raising today. But there have been some positive elements. Philip will tell us about some positive uh, development in their areas, for example. And telemedicine is another area which has been quite interesting. I'm just asking you for the second slide, please. 
So this is a, uh, a summary slide of uh, some of the future gazing elements that we have been encountered in, during this year. And I would say that my biggest worry at the moment is that governments may slow down the progress on dementia. So that's why we need words, but we also need action. I would also ask you to uh, spend a little bit of time on the last bullet, which is around the vaccination. We have been amongst the organization uh, that have been uh, advocating for vulnerable people to receive the vaccine first. This does not just include higher income countries, it includes lower income countries with all the logistical difficulties that this may um, may see. And we have been heartened to see both COVAX and the ACT accelerator being so eloquent about this. And so many higher income countries, Canada amongst them, thank you, Franca, for, for, for your commitment as Canada to that, to make sure that lower income countries will receive it too. I will encourage all of you to have a look at the panel that is coming later today on uh, lower income countries, because there's gonna be some very interesting discussions there. I think above all, COVID-19 has shown everybody that there are pandemics and the solutions for those pandemics are global. And we do know that dementia is an epidemic and the solution for that is global. And I think this year, more than any other time, we have understood the importance of working together towards a solution. Now, without further ado, I am going to uh, bring my panel in, and the first person I'm going to bring in is Franca Gatto. Franca, I can ask you to unmute yourself, you've done it already, so organized. Uh, Franca, I've got uh, a question in two um, sides for you. Uh, and the first question is, Canada's national dementia strategy is still fairly new. How is the implementation progressing? What can you tell us about how you're doing, especially during this time? And because of this time, how has COVID-19 impacted the development and deployment of your strategy? Thank you, Flanka. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Paola, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, join you today and to uh, uh, give you some of the Canadian context. Uh, in Canada, as uh, Paola mentioned, um, we are still in the very early stages of implementing our first national dementia strategy. Ours was released in June, 2019. <clears throat> and before I get into some of that detail, I could, uh, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the COVID context. And obviously COVID has affected not just, in, not just individuals, but health systems around the world in an unprecedented manner. And Canada is not uh, any different as in other countries. Uh, COVID has uh, resulted in significant challenges for people living with dementia and their families, friends, and caregivers. Uh, there have been some challenges in moving ahead on, on some of our work, I, I, I have to admit. Um, and But all our original planning is still intact. Um, what has been affected has been some of our timelines. Um, so for example, uh, some of our partners, so our funding, uh, we, we provide funding to community partners and others. Um, some of them have either been unable to deliver on some of the original plan programming, um, and they've had to readjust their approach, especially given the limitations um, in Canada to, to in-person events in, in some cases. Whereas in other areas, work has just been slowed down um, just because of certain lockdowns or competing priorities. So our partner organizations have had to deal with other priorities. Um, in some cases, they don't have as many staff. So, um, so, there's, so, so there has been some slowdown. But, um, and then we've also had to move some of our project start dates. Um, for example, our awareness uh, initiatives were originally scheduled to start this fall. Uh, it looks like they will be starting in spring. However, you know, the timeline has given our applicants uh, some extra time as well, and it gives them has given them the opportunity to adjust some of the activities and proposals before we make our final funding decisions. Um, so it's, it's given them time to reflect and adapt on what they want to do with uh, government funding um, so that it reflects some of the COVID realities and the COVID specific public health guidance. Um, so for example, they can their, their proposals are now including um, how to run their awareness activities given the physical distance uh, public health measures, 
Uh, and this is easier to do at the front end as opposed to backtracking later and having to retool their programming, which is happening on with some of our programmings. So, um, so I'll get into a little bit more on, on uh, what we've uh, done with some of that programming money. Um, but for now, I'll just talk a little bit about the National Dementia Strategy um, and just give you an, a, a, a sort of an overview of some of what we've been doing to implement it since it was launched last year. For those of you who don't know, uh, our strategy sets out three national objectives, prevent dementia, advance therapies and find a cure, and improve the quality of life of people living with dementia and their caregivers. We've also recently tabled an annual report in Canada's national parliament. This is uh, something that our legislation requires. And this year's report provides an overview of some of the many and varied efforts taking place across the country that are helping to support the strategies of implementing, the strategies implementation, sorry. Uh, the report also provides a snapshot of the state of dementia in Canada. So when I say it, the varied efforts taking place, uh, these aren't just federal efforts. These are efforts at the provincial level, because in Canada, our provincial and territorial governments are, um, re are, are responsible for much of the health and, and social care, social delivery. But it also reflects some of what's happening in our not-for-profit sector. Uh, so what we try to do with uh, this report is really um, demonstrate that responding to the national strategy is going to be a collective effort. Um, we've also, the government of Canada has also made some strategic investments to support the strategy's implementation, specifically in the areas of research, surveillance, community programming, raising awareness, and guidance on diagnosis and treatment. So one of our key contributions at the Public Health Agency is uh, a $40 million five-year fund, uh, which, is, which, which supports the development of a national public education and awareness campaign, which we are hoping to kick off in 2021. Target awareness raising initiatives in where we provide funds to community organizations and partners to deliver awareness raising initiatives. Uh, initiatives that support access to and use of dementia guidance. Um, and in this case, um, you know, the COVID context has reminded us that guidance related to emergencies and pandemics are just as important as, as other pieces of guidance. So that's an, uh, an addition to that work. And we're also hoping to create a comprehensive online information portal that will help um, share um, resources that are evidence-based with Canadians. Um, and then to support the strategy's implementation and to better understand dementia in Canada, we conducted a public opinion, uh, some public opinion research earlier this year. And this data provides us with a national baseline of uh, Canadians awareness, attitudes, perceptions and behaviors related to dementia. So we really wanted to do that early on in our strategies implementation so that we can uh, help to measure our success in subsequent years. We also conducted some focus groups earlier this year to help inform our upcoming national public education campaign. Another fund, and this is a, an ongoing uh, fund of $4 million a, a year, uh, it supports community-based projects that aim to optimize the well-being of people living with dementia and family friend caregivers. These projects are helping to increase knowledge about dementia and related risk and protective factors. And through this investment, we are funding 17 projects in areas such as the development and testing of a national dementia-friendly toolkit to help educate and train professionals, developing culturally appropriate resources for family friend caregivers in select Inuit communities, communities I'm sorry. Um, and in this case, we've also uh, recently uh, issued a call for proposals just uh, a few well, November, uh, no, just closed in November. We issued it in October, I'm sorry. Um, and th in this case, we've asked that uh, projects identify innovative and virtual solutions that uh, are, adapt to the new challenges for people living with dementia and caregivers resulting from COVID-19. 
And we're hoping that these, uh, these address solutions related to those challenges and the public health measures I mentioned earlier um, that have resulted in social isolation um, and require physical distancing. Um, and just to speak to Paula's point about data, Canada also uh, announced as part of our implementation $10 million over five years to, to enhance dementia surveillance, to help us better understand the, the impact of dementia in our communities. And we're hoping that this investment will result in higher quality, multi-sectoral data on dementia that will help inform our programs, our healthcare planning, service delivery, so that we can better meet the needs of people living with dementia and family friend caregivers. We also continue to invest in research in Canada um, and the, our, uh, uh, the research objectives are, are, are similar to those in our national dementia strategy, which are to prevent dementia, delay the clinical progression of symptoms and improve the quality of life. Um, and essentially, essentially supporting um, all of that research. Um, and we, the Government of Canada extended funding over five years uh, in 2019 to the Canadian Consortium on Neurogenetic Degeneration and Aging. That's, this is Canada's research hub on neurogenetic degenerative diseases um, that affect cognition. Um, and this is phase two of their work. Um, and then I think I'll stop there. And while there's still a lot of work to be done, we I, I have to admit, um, I hope it does give you a high level overview of some of the steps we're taking um, to implement Canada's Net First National Dementia Strategy uh, and um, adapting to the COVID context. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much, Franca. What a fantastic program. I mean, um, some of our members uh, would say it's taken a long time to Canada to get to this point, but boy, you are uh, investing in it. And is it really important to see also the level, the breadth, the complexity of the funding? You really are looking at your strands that you mentioned earlier in, in great detail, uh, looking at how you can bolster and strengthen all of them. Um, you know, we, we all look forward to seeing the results of your strategy. Of course, it will take some time for all of us to see how uh, this will pan out in the population and how uh, people at the grassroots level will feel the difference. But we certainly be there with you uh, to, to work on how to make sure that the most people possible can benefit from that. So thank you uh, very much. I'm sure there will be questions. I can remind everybody, please do send your question through the uh, chat Q&A facility. Uh, and uh, we will try and answer some of them at the end of the meeting. Now, uh, I will pass uh, the floor to Wally Wang. Um, Wally, uh, you have worked with ADI at the very, very beginning of the pandemic uh, to get out vital advice for healthcare practitioners. We were both out there uh, as early as March. People really were desperate for information then and you were the first of the block, really. Uh, you were at the same time supporting the development the, of the Chinese National Dementia Plan that was announced this autumn. So how do you see the last eight months? How has COVID impacted uh, the dementia community? What kind of lesson have you learned? But also what was the reaction of healthcare practitioners to the advice you gave. I know recently you spoke at an event where there were thousands of people eager to understand what kind of advice uh, could be given. So, Wally, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, it's my great pleasure to join this Lausanne Forum. Uh, I think that uh, the questions are quite um, constructive, that we can think about how COVID-19 have impacted our life, impacted our work, and how it could help us to change the world. So regarding how COVID-19 has changed our perspective on how to create more positive atmosphere for people living with dementia, I think that in the past months we have been doing a lot. Um, so I would like to share a couple of things that we can observe during the past months. Uh, first, as Paula mentioned, our government have, has officially announced 
the dementia strategic plan. Um, this plan includes six parts. The first and the most important is to improve the public awareness of dementia in the society. So the, the government encouraged we can make use of different types of media to support the awareness raising campaigns. So COVID-19 has helped us realize that telemedicine, remote, virtual educational opportunities. So I think that in the future, we can try to make use of all these different types of media, not only uh, person to uh, face to face situation, but we can also use a lot of virtual and educational courses on the on on the website, on the internet, to support awareness raising campaigns. And the second part of the plan was to improve the uh, screening rate of cognitive impairment. We understand that there's a huge gap of diagnosis and treatment of dementia in our country. So one step to improve or to minimize this gap was trying to help people who have not been identified to be noticed. So screening, a cognitive screening accompanied with physical health checkup might be a solution to help us to find more people who could seek timely, uh, timely diagnosis. And the third part of the plan was trying to create a coordinated multidisciplinary care for people living with dementia, people living with mild cognitive impairment, and also people who pay attention to their own cognitive function. So in this part, we encourage people working in different disciplines, for example, not only healthcare professionals, but also social workers, uh, nurses, caring staffs, could also participate in this uh, in this work because people can take different roles and take have their different uh, responsibilities in improving dementia care. And the other three parts uh, include like how to create a multidisciplinary service team. Um, we need to create or set up memory clinics, uh, more memory clinics uh, all over the country, so that people can seek timely diagnosis if they need. And we also need to uh, try to improve the capacity building because we understand that a lot of care staffs, they have low knowledge of dementia. So in this plan, we encourage that um, capacity building should be promoted in the coming years. And the last one, but also not the least important is we need to create a platform for data sharing and information exchange. So I think that in the next few years, with the implementation of this plan, we can try to improve uh, the timely diagnosis of dementia in the society, but also we can create more friendly in the society. Um, regarding the other um, more concrete changes that we can observe, I think that we observe that the role of community health centers have been, has been strengthened in the past months because community health centers have played very important roles during the COVID-19 um, battle. So they realize that they feel more confident. Uh, they, they think that they have more capacity to support the people living in their neighborhood. So I think that this is one um, prominent change I have ever observed because in the past months, um, more and more memory clinics or more and more community health centers started to pay attention to dementia care in their community. They started to set up facilities for people for early screening and also for like cognitive training and uh, for caregiver support. Uh, groups. So I think that this is one prominent change I have ever observed. Um, I, I do not want to talk too much about the telemedicine and the virtual courses because it is a like universal phenomenon. So I don't want to talk too much about this. But I would like to mention that during the COVID-19 pandemic, actually WHO and also in United Nations Standing Committee 
have uh, updated the guideline for providing mental health and psychosocial support for people during this emergency situations. I think that this is the first time we pay attention to all the adults in this in the disaster management. And the updated guideline, I think that in the future will be a very good resources for us to manage uh, the emergency situation because we understand that all the adults, particularly people living with dementia, they are not only suffered from physical conditions, but they also they might um, be experiencing a lot of anxiety. They might have concerns over their situations. So we need to pay attention to their mental health status because they, this might result in behavior changes and might bring more burden for, the, uh, for their families. So I think that this is a good strategy and a good step that we have taken forward. So in the future, this will help us to be more prepared for disaster management for people living with dementia in the situation. And, and lastly, I would also highlight the importance that we need to pay attention to the neurological and the psychiatric outcome of people who have, a, who have recovered from COVID-19 because there are cases uh, talking about their neuro, neuro, neurological disorders and the psychiatric outcomes during COVID-19 infection. So I think that in order to prevent uh, the onset of dementia, we need to pay attention to this population. We need to provide more uh, preventive strategy for the people who have recovered from COVID-19, but currently they are not living with dementia, but in the future, they might be a high risk population. I'm not sure. So in the future, we need to do a lot of research on this to support this, uh, this group of people and try to uh, make dementia prevention to be more practical in the future. So thank you, Paula. I, this is my personal perspective. Hope that we can uh, work together in the world to support people living with dementia and also people who recovered from COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wali. Thank you for pointing out uh, to us the, the, the broad details of the Chinese National Dementia Plan, which I know is huge. It serves a billion people, so let's not forget this is a, a plan that is going to have a massive impact on dementia. Thank you also for highlighting issues of cognitive deterioration and mental health. I'm sure the case Waffa will be able to tell us much more. We have been receiving increasing amount of um, information about these things are not looking good and also thanks for pointing out the point problem about recovery um, which I think they are being much less talked about as ever you're breaking new ground and I think this is a really important point that we will need to work on uh, going forward uh, also the recovery obviously of families and carers that have been impacted so uh, badly, but not being able uh, to interact with their loved one, uh, that seems to be having a, a tremendous impact on well-being and mental health as well. Thank you so much. Um, now, I'm going to briefly pass to uh, Philip. Uh, now, Philip has had a very interesting experience uh, from a completely different viewpoint. Um, obviously, Philip, there's been a huge amount of attention to care homes during the pandemic and the difficulties they have faced. Care at home, however, which is your area of expertise, how did you adapt to this new world of social distances, the new rules, the regulation about entering in people's homes? Uh, what have you adapted to ensure ongoing care? How did the home instead react? What was what, what changed in your world? And um, also, uh, I wanted to know if you have had any examples of family relocating loved ones from care homes back into their own homes. Uh, how have you been supporting it? So the floor is yours. Thank you, Paola, for giving us the opportunity to share a few learnings and give you some insight into what we do. Home Instead is in 90,000 households in 14 countries every week. As a global company, we were hit by the waves going around the world in stages. First in autumn 2019 when China closed, then in spring 2020 in Europe and later in the year in America too. So let me give you some background first about how the virus affected us as a home care company in general. 
In wave one, we temporarily lost about 20 to 25% of our clients in every market. Those that we lost were mostly small and did not need a lot of care, but they were afraid that someone coming to their home would infect them. More than 80% of these clients returned after wave one. In general, bigger clients who really needed the support continued our services. And, and that's a learning we, we just experienced in the last couple of months, we gained new clients who desperately needed our attention and care because the usual caregiver was not able to come anymore. For example, travel restrictions in Europe or because the caregiver themselves were afraid of being infected. But it was not only clients who were affected. Our caregivers are 50 to 55 year old on average. Approximately 20% are over 65 and belong to the high risk group now. So here in Switzerland, for example, a federal act put in place overnight forced us to withdraw them from all client facing work. And I can tell you this was quite a challenge. Then initially, all providers, including public service and the military, suffered from a shortage of supplies, such as disinfectant, masks and PPE. We had to find, and we found, ways to source supplies from alternative channels. Once the supply chain was re-established, we ensured all caregivers had access to all supplies they needed. And in addition, Home Instead declared wearing masks mandatory long before it became compulsory uh, by state regulations, for example. Then clearly we had positive cases, eh? be they clients, caregivers or office staff. And all these positive cases were addressed and solved on a case by one basis or case by case basis, excuse me. We regularly monitored the situation from our national headquarter, updated our teams via virtual calls and followed up with written instructions to our branch offices. And one thing to mention in this uh, con connection is that we were super strict in following the changing official recommendations and rules at the source and instructed our teams not to create their own checklists under no circumstances to ensure accuracy and compliance at all times. So COVID acted as a catalyst. It validated the Home Instead mission to change the face of aging by serving our seniors in their home. And here's why. Home is the safest place for everyone. I will come back to this in a minute. Yeah? Second, hygiene is very important for us as caregivers and for our clients uh, as seniors at home. As a company, Home Instead has educated employees globally on hygiene for 26 years. Throughout our entire history, we've always been training to reduce the spread of any infectious disease, including the flu and now COVID-19. So COVID proved that we were knowledgeable, but we had to adapt the way we taught and this basically overnight too. When, for example, classroom trainings were not possible anymore, we created video content with our e-learning platform and trained our caregivers virtually. This shows that technology is important too. As just outlined before, having the right technology allows us to train our caregivers and to provide our services professionally. This again allows us to focus on our clients as a human being. They're not just seniors or patients, they're human beings and to spend more time with them and to provide a personalized high touch care experience. Now, as we are at the Lausanne conference, let me share some of our learnings about COVID and dementia with you. About two thirds of our clients around the globe suffer from different grades of dementia. What we learned in the last 12 months, 12 to let's even 15 months, is that masks, for example, prove to be very difficult. Because we are also used to see human faces, and these faces are hidden now. Then changes of personal caregiver, like I mentioned, because of travel restrictions or of age limit, were unsettling. There were just too many new and masked faces and too many ad hoc changes in the daily routine for people affected with dementia. There is a positive trend, however, and this was seen in the live-in segment where we often had to extend shifts from the normal 14 days to four to six weeks. And this proved to be very beneficial to both the client and the caregiver. It was also safe because it was a stable one-to-one -one relationship without many outside contacts. 
The downside was the risk of cabin fever after a few weeks. And as we all know, social distancing and social isolation are a big issue too. So you asked me before if we had any examples of families relocating loved ones from care homes back into family homes and how we were supporting this. A family home, or let's say any type of home and care at home, is essential and brings immense value to the overall healthcare system. Nursing homes were closed to visitors for weeks as no physical contact was allowed. Residents felt they were like locked up in prison while relatives were literally locked out. However, this was not sufficient. The virus found a way into many old people's and nursing homes, which then became an incubator for the virus. The closure did not prevent 50, again, 50, 50% of all deaths related to COVID from occurring in long-term care facilities. Last night, latest numbers from Germany showed that 50% of all infections happened in care facilities. So during the pandemic, these facilities are a dangerous place. And this is where we come in, yeah? I'll speak about that in a, in a second. Uh, but the reason why they are dangerous is are only partially known. So one reason we do know of is an increased risk of infection for people living in large households. There's simply too many people and not enough space. And it's not only residents that are affected. Also staff gets infected, and this leads to a staff shortage, and those that remain are working under extreme pressure. So now in wave two around the globe, we see that long-term care facilities face fewer new admissions, and all of these institutions are trying to find the right balance between protecting their seniors and their staff from infection while allowing some sort of social interaction. And specific to people affected by dementia, the spatial and social isolation from family and important caregivers led to rapid cognitive decline and sometimes physical disintegration. This was often followed by secondary diseases that proved to be fatal. So I would say during the pandemic, the world has seen what home instead have been advocating for the last 26 years. Home is the best and safest place to care for our loved ones. It is familiar, people feel safe, they control who they have contact to, and ideally at these times, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, and at home, no one has the risk of getting infected in large groups. So coming back to your question about nursing homes, one experience I would like to share is our intensified collaboration with nursing homes and also hospitals. I mentioned before that staff in these facilities are under tremendous pressure and need urgent support. So what can be done? Homes that developed plans to supply nursing homes with additional caregivers to cover staff shortages. We have seen families around the globe taking their loved ones out of care facilities back home. In most cases, this is not possible without additional support because there was a reason why they originally went in. But when uh, families approached us and asked for help, we have done everything we can do to support each individual in every possible way. And currently, hospitals are running at full capacity. We have developed good partnerships with hospitals to help free up beds to create space for new COVID patients. This is a very important contribution to the overall healthcare system. We experienced that positive patients were told to leave hospital because their beds were needed for more severe cases. And in these situations, we moved the patients back home and our caregivers looked after them until they were better. So the world has changed since we last met in Lausanne just one year ago, but we can do something. Together, we're all here to listen and learn and to drive innovation to improve the quality of life for the ones who need it. From our perspective, home care is the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. It was an interesting presentation and what incredible challenges you had and how uh, you have to react is, is fascinating as a, as a business studies as well. Um, from our viewpoint, obviously, uh, this has had a massive impact I, uh, for people that are interested also in care home and what happened. The very impacted in our world as support, which was about design and dementia, uh, which pointed out how some of these issues could have been avoided probably with better design, better design of space, 
and better controls on how infections get spread. So there are also ways around it. Uh, not that I don't agree with Philip that home care is uh, a much better way of doing it, uh, but I think it's interesting to also to hear that. Now, without further ado, let me give the floor to Kate Woffa. I also understand that Kate's internet may be a bit wobbly, so we better get your intervention as soon as possible. Kate, through DAI Network and your ongoing support program for people living with dementia, can you please give us a positive example of how people living with dementia have adapted during the pandemic? Perhaps some examples, strategies or interventions that people have made to counter some of the issues created by isolation, distancing, interruption to traditional face-to-face -face support. Now, I know there's been plenty of negative, it's much harder to draw the positives, uh, but I'm sure, Kate, you can do that, but unmute yourself uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Paola, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, be on the panel again with uh, my esteemed colleagues. Um, yes, it is hard to be positive some of the time, Paola. Um, I think that what people with dementia have been saying fairly consistently since the pandemic um, is that very much for them, life didn't change a lot. They experienced physical and social isolation and loneliness pretty much from the time they were diagnosed. Um, but depending on where people live around the world as to just how much of an impact that's been. Um, I just wanted to make one comment on, on Philip's uh, discussion before I go on um, is that what I would really like to see, and there are some people who absolutely need assisted living, um, and I think it would have been a really good thing during this pandemic to train up family members to become uh, paid care staff in care homes that would reduce that the restrictions that have been the isolation that's, that's caused families um, such angst during this pandemic. But what we have done, I think, because DAI is a global organisation um, and we don't have offices and we can't provide, we've never provided face-to-face -face support, um, we were using Zoom for well, nearly seven years. So um, our membership was already quite used to the online virtual world. Um, and uh, some of the positive things that, that people with dementia have either um, initiated themselves or organisations around them have been doing. Um, uh, people are doing online art, online yoga classes, online singing classes, online um, musical instrument classes. Um, so there's been a lot of increase in the services and uh, a couple of years ago, even a year ago, DAI was really the only organisation offering people with dementia online support and now almost every organisation that provides any sort of advocacy for people with dementia and our families is providing online support. So I'm really, we're really hopeful that that will change uh, because that's increased access for people who live in remote communities. I think one of the challenges that people with dementia have had with the, you know, the increase of not being able to go out at all is that um, many people are reporting they feel like their symptoms of dementia or their disabilities have got a lot worse during this pandemic. So, um, you know, I think that's something to be, to be mindful of uh, when we talk about providing services for people with dementia. Um, Kate, thank you very much. This is all extremely... Um well, I mean, you, you've done the best that you could do, but of course it has been against a tide of incredibly difficult circumstances. I um, would like now to involve the whole panel in a discussion, if we may. Uh, we don't have much time. I think we've got only about seven, eight minutes left. Uh, but there is one question that I'd like to start with Franca on. Um, there have been, you know, vulnerable populations throughout this period of time. In particular, in Canada, there is some groups that have been uh, difficult to reach. So I was wondering how you have uh, coped with that particular challenge. And given I'm asking it to Franca, I'd like to involve also Wally afterwards in this question and ask also Kate and Philip whether they have had specific instances and how they may have uh, involved the people at this level. Franca, you first. 
Okay, I'll try to be brief because I know we're uh, we're running out of time. Um, but so in, in, in Canada, there's been um, quite a few investments um, made by the government of Canada addressed towards vulnerable populations. And I'll mention a couple. Um, so again, not specifically for people living with dementia, but by virtue of the, the target audience being vulnerable populations, these supports are obviously available to people living with dementia. So um, one of the first event, um, uh, investments in April was uh, $350 million for an emergency community support fund. And this was, was meant to help community support, such as home delivery of groceries and medications, um, helping to provide transport services for vulnerable populations, um, and that and those types of supports. Uh, we've got a, a safe restart agreement. So like I said earlier, well, the government of Canada works closely with provinces and territories um, and uh, funding has gone through um, through various streams. The safe restart agreement was 740 million uh, for the next uh, several months to support costs um, for measures to control and prevent infections, for example. Um, and this could also address uh, staffing issues in long-term care homes in home care and palliative care facilities and services. I'll stop there just because I want to make sure my, my colleagues uh, around the table have, uh, have a moment to answer as well. Uh, Wally, do you want to come into this one? Yeah, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Franca. Um, I just want to add one uh, that um, since we cannot um, face, we cannot have face-to-face -face communication, but during the uh, this the past months, actually for those vulnerable population, a lot of foundations have invested to support people um, in the area. And, and also the companies, especially internet companies, they support for uh, remote educational courses. So this help us to uh, reach uh, the people, not only the old adults, but also for those who are who might have mental health problems, they can reach all the resources no matter where they live. So in China, WeChat is one of the most popular uh, app that we use. So a lot of app courses, app lectures, webinars uh, were launched. So I think that this is the way that we have used it most often. Thank you. Now it's my turn to unmute. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wally. Yes, uh, a lot of plenty of examples in South America as well, actually, of where that has been particularly um, helpful. Although in many countries also we have heard that obviously the incapacity to access technology has been in a way um, an added barrier, uh, whether it is because of poverty, either of instrumentation, technology or of connectivity. Um, Kate, do you have any example that you wanted to share with us? I don't have a lot to add, actually, Paula. Thank you. Okay. And Philip? Well, like I said before, technology uh, is one important aspect uh, that helps staying in contact at the moment, uh, but also helps uh, to focus on the right thing. So everything technology can be done, do should be done by technology, and this frees up time to stay uh, physically in touch with the person on a one-to-one, -one, uh, like I said, uh, and to um, provide a high care experience. Lovely, thanks very much. So I've got one quick question for you before I'll ask you some final thoughts. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on access to vaccine for people with dementia? Um, Kate? Oh, that's a mixed uh, conversation around the world, Paula. Some people uh, say they would take it straight away. Other people with dementia say they don't want to take it ever. Um, so it's a really interesting conversation amongst the cohort of people with dementia. I think that family members, care partners, particularly um, uh, those with a family member in a residential facility are very keen for the vaccine. Um, to be available for them. And, you know, I think community at large, people are pretty keen on a vaccine. Thank you very much. I think we'll have a big job on our hand, all of us working in international uh, organisations, 
um, to uh, contribute to the discourse in, in order to try and get people to, to get vaccinated and for us to move forward. That's going to be one of our biggest role, really, I, I can imagine. Franca, a few thoughts from the Canadian government on this matter? Sure. The, um, so vaccine rollout is, is is a key focus at the public health agency right now. Um, obviously, it's it's uh, something that uh, they're paying uh, close attention to as vaccines are um, hopefully being approved uh, soon. Uh, there, in November, our national advisory committee on immunization uh, issued some advice to our federal, provincial, and territorial governments. So that advice is definitely going to be uh, a key consideration as as those rollout strategies uh, are, are are put in place. Thank you very much. We're short on time, I'm told, from the director. So very briefly, all of you, two seconds, uh, your final call to action. Wally, you first. I think that we can support people living with dementia forever. That is a lovely one. Uh, Philip. Yeah, we need to stay at home. Home is the safest place for people with dementia and also people without dementia. And the rest around us need to join forces to work together to look after people who need it. Thank you so much, Philippe. Franca? Thank you. So I think uh, I'll echo Philip in terms of following public health advice because that's uh, the best way to get through this. And I'd also just echo, uh, repeat what I said earlier in terms of Addressing dementia really is a collective um, a, a responsibility. It's not going to happen from one government or one organization. It really is everyone's responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Kate? I think uh, let's all co collaborate and cooperate uh, and let's not forget people with dementia after this pandemic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to my lovely panelists. My final thoughts are we need to work together. This is not something we are going to work uh, out of or we're going to resolve with our collaboration. So thank you for those of you who have been listening to us and thank you uh, for following the forthcoming panels. We are delighted to be as ever on this platform and we wish the rest of the proceedings a uh, very good time and luck. Thank you so much and uh, the floor is back to the director. Thank you so much. Bye.